morning, everyone. Uh, so this is the this is my master's thesis, uh, my, my final year um, at the University of Bristol. Um, and yeah, looking at the dinosaur jaw mechanism. So I'm sure I don't really need to give a big introduction about dinosaurs. We all know what they are. Um, a really successful group of archosaurs which dominated terrestrial ecosystems all the way pretty much through the Mesozoic. And they got everywhere, as you can see, this the, like, the Antarctic Circle. See that? Um, but yeah, why, why look at the jaws? Now, there's one simple answer to this, and that's <laughs> the immediate relevance ecologically. It's one of the main interfaces, physical interfaces, between an animal and its food. And so, it's immediately ecologically relevant. And therefore, it makes a pretty good potential target for natural selection. And also, it has quite a complex relationship between the form of the jaws and their function, depending on which group you look at. It's a very interesting feature to see. And also, it can be quite easily modelled. Essentially, it's just a leading mechanism. So, you can quite easily measure how well it performs. And there's lots of different metrics for doing this. And the one that I've decided to look at is mechanical advantage. This is very easily measured its metric, which is basically looking at the efficiency of the jaw mechanism, not necessarily the absolute force. It's uh, basically the ratio of the force that's put into the jaw system by the adductor muscles to what is actually applied at whatever bite point you choose to measure. And this particular metric has been shown to be quite important. So this is some work that's been done on uh, bats, uh, modern bats. And so this is showing the different skull forms associated with different uh, dietary specialisms clustered together mechanically. They've got similar mechanical advantages. And uh, so basically I want to look at something similar in dinosaurs. Now, of course, reconstructing the jaw mechanics in dinosaurs is quite difficult because they are dead. Um, but we do have ways of working out what muscles should be there by looking at their living relatives. That's by doing excellent phylogenetic bracketing. So we use birds and alligators, they've, they've got these three groups, so we worked out that, well, we, we generally assume that dinosaurs probably had them as well. And you can work out roughly where these muscles would have attached from various surface features, on the bones, so muscle scars, smooth points, and, and um, in the absence of any features like that, their relationship positionally with other muscles that you can work out. So I think you can also use um, the position of the trigeminal nerve um, as something for landmarks as well. Um, in, as well as being important on an individual basis, it, it, it could potentially be important ecologically in a wider context. So these are two separate studies that have looked at potential impacts of jaw mechanics on niche partitioning. Um, can't quite see it very well there, but you can see that um, this is the dinosaur park formation in Alberta. Um, so these, these two, the uh, ceratopsians and hadrosaurs, probably had access to quite a wide range of foods. So they've got these quite sophisticated jaw mechanisms with a high mechanical advantage, so it being quite forceful being able to grind, grind up foods, whereas ankylosaurs probably had quite weaker bites, and therefore they would have been limited to these smaller food items, which reduces competition. And in similar cases here, in Morrison formation, sauropods had these two distinct clusters in um, the performance space, which are um, polyphyletic, which, uh, again, potentially uh, reduce competition for food. Now, the main aim of this project was just to give an overview of how MA varies through dinosauria in general, because no one's really looked at this. It's been, it's been done in specific groups. It's been done for specific paleo environments, but no one's looked at all of them all at once. And the hypotheses I, made, uh, I aimed to test were mainly relating to studies um, on living animals, and just seeing whether it is the case with dinosaurs as well, uh, except for this one here, which is a testing for phylogenetic signal, which I'll come to in a second. So the measurements that I use for this are heavily based on a study by Manabu Sakamoto in 2010, um, in that you can work out the axial lines of action for each uh, jaw muscle group uh, using the anterior most and posterior most extents of where the muscle should attach. But instead of doing it uh, mathematically, uh, Sakamoto mathematically derived this using uh, algebra and stuff, um, I'm not very good at maths, so I did it by eye. And I, I managed to generate very similar results, so um, it worked out well. well. So, ooh, that, so that should say the mechanical advantage is um, basically the ratio of this distance here for each muscle group to the distance between the joint and the bite point. So basically I was able to work out mechanical advantage for each of the three groups for each of these three bite positions. I did this for 144 taxa using ImageJ to make measurements. Um, 
effects, yeah. So the results, this is, this is like the, the big result. Um, this is just using mean mechanical advantage for the whole jaw. Um, and there's immediately a difference between the ornithischians and the sauroscians. You can see, and this is statistically significant. The uh, ornithischians do generally have higher energy values. Um, they're also a bit more homogenous. You've got these sort of isolated increases going on in the series of things, which is quite interesting. Also, especially low values in these birds. Um, most, of this, um, most of this variation is going on at the back, which is probably to be expected because that's closer to where the jaws actually attach. Um, um, also, there are a few PCA plots. So, this, this is using dividing it up by a muscle group. So seeing sort of how each muscle group contributes to the overall MA. And you can see immediately that herbivores, so this is divided by diet and this is divided by, um, by phylogenetic group. And herbivores occupy a much larger area of performance space. But this is mainly because the ones that are over here are herbivorous theropods and sauropods. They're sort of dragging the performance space down in this way, which is quite interesting. Um, and most of this variation is associated with the, the main adductor group. Just the one that pretty much goes at a right angle um, to the axis of the skull. Um, when done by bite position, it's a similar situation. The only difference seems to be we've got thyroforins over here. Interestingly, like if you look at um, how each muscle group is contributing, they're quite similar to ceriscians, whereas the actual result of this in um, the EMA of each bite point is much more like uh, the ones they're more closely related to. Um, also, this that the carnivorous space, especially if you exclude Coelophysis and Herorosaurus, which are kind of unusual, the actual performance space of carnivores is very narrow. So, some other things to notice, these, these are the same ones again, but just divided by diet. We've got an interesting convergence over here in that these two tyrannosaurs have similar um, relative contributions of um, MA to these two ankylosaurs. And of course, these, these two different groups had completely different bite properties. You know, the absolute bite forces are, are completely different. So that's um, just an interesting thing to notice. All down here, the ornithopods, so specialised in eating tough plant matter, they all cluster together, that's to be expected. Um, interesting, we've got generally down here, we have sort of slender skulls and gressile um, theropods and carnivores. And up here, we have the larger hypercarnivores, so there's a bit of a gradation going on there. Um, Herrerasaurus also, that's, that's an interesting one. Because the, although having quite carnivorous features of its teeth and the mandible, its jaw mechanics seem to plot it nearer to the herbivores. This could potentially mean that the jaw mechanics actually take longer to adapt and that these features like the teeth uh, develop first, potentially. Uh, yeah. And also, the, as, as seen in the uh, few slides ago, the, one, the sauropods that are close to Diplodocus, they plot over here, whereas all the other sauropods are over here. So the scaling, this, this was a, a small part of the study to see whether there's any sort of anometric scaling going on. And within the entire data set, through all those of those, there's nothing, basically. Very, very slight in theropods, which um, is probably a reflection of this correlation here. But generally, it seems to be that there's, there's not much relationship going on there. Uh, the phylogenetic signal, so this is basically a, a way of looking at, I'm sure many of you know this already, uh, how to decide whether the traits variation is actually due to adaptation or whether it's to do with how things are related to each other, whether phylogeny is a more um, strong dictator. And with theropods, it's already been established that, it's, that the signal is quite strong, and um, my, my work has confirmed this. Um, in ornithopods, it's a little bit less, but the, these two really low values, although it could be taken as being quite there's quite a strong amount of adaptation going on. I think it's mainly down to small sample sizes. Um, Pagel's lambda, which is the, the statistic I use, has been shown to be quite strong, quite good, even with small sample sizes, but there is a lower limit. And my sample, my sample was quite biased uh, towards theropods and ornithopods. But this is still quite an interesting result, and it's the basis of um, the main discussion point that I'll come on to. So yeah, in, in summary, uh, with the related to the hypothesis I wanted to test, herbivores do generally have a higher MA. Um, although herbivorous uh, theropods seem to be bucking the trend in that. Uh, dietary specialisms tend to cluster together. Um, it doesn't seem to be related to the body size, and ornithopods have weaker signal for MA than theropods did.
And this, this, um, the, what, as to why there's this difference in the signal going on, I think it's mainly to do with, so I, I showed earlier that the, the main group is the one that varies the most. So here we've got a different steroid, a thesaurus, and the thing over here. The main difference between the two, in terms of where the main is attaching, is that ornithischians have this coronoid process here, and uh, the thoracoid doesn't. Now this part of the skull, where the, the main attaches up here, it has been shown to be the most morphologically variable in thoracoid skulls, but there's a limit as to how much the main group would have been able to adapt because of the lack of this process. So I think this anatomical constraint is what led to the, the developing these other features, so losing the teeth progressively, um, having a longer neck and things like that, because there's this limit going on. Um, so yeah, we're wondering other features to compensate for that. Um, which have been suggested in other studies already. Um, so yeah, and again, it, it could potentially relate to how not only was the uh, phylogenetic constraints on jaw musculature and herbivorous theropods, but also maybe it's it was just quicker. It is, you know, these these kind of features, losing the teeth and having a long neck and all that, develop quicker, and therefore that's why we obviously those. Um, in a broader context, of course, it's important to realise that jaw musculature is only one part of adaptation um, for, for, for feeding. And so we wouldn't expect there to be convergence across all herbivores. They wouldn't, they wouldn't all have the same mechanical properties just because they ate plants. And herbivorous therapods certainly show this. Um, yeah, and also it results in some very, these very strange mechanical convergences like between the tyrannosaurs and ankylosaurs. Uh, so yeah. The future directions for this, therefore, um, so my, like I said, my sample was very, very biased towards ornithopods and theropods, and this is mainly because there's not much skull, uh, there aren't many skulls available for sauropod morphs and theropods. Um, so I think it would be better to use, incorporate more perhaps speculative reconstructions just to keep it more representative. This would increase uncertainty, but at least it would mean that you're, you're better able to give a, a rough comparison between groups. Uh, also important to consider that NA is a two-dimensional metric. It's very easy to measure, hence why I used it, because I didn't have much time. Uh, it's only a master's project. Um, but again, it, doesn't, it isn't a full descriptor of jaw function. Of course, um, it's been suggested in like, hydrosaurs that there's a lot of uh, lateral motion going on as well. So future work should probably take that into account, see if that could be included in performance metrics. Um, considering other adaptations, so this is a paper from last year showing that if you actually look at the teeth or the tooth morphology, that's quite a good indication as well, so incorporating that would be useful. And of course, um, looking at the relative influences on not just um, adaptation and phylogeny, but looking at whether niche partitioning is uh, quite a strong force, generally, like maybe partitioning the data regionally would probably help as well. So yeah, that's, that's it.